Okay, so um, today we're going to like talk about quiz four, which is on chapters 20, 22, and 23. Um, so the first question that we have is define the pathophysiology of asthma, the etiology, the risk factors, complications, and provide nursing management, including medications. And she also said to see the medication list that she provided. Um, definitely, I think the medication list is good to just see like what sorts of medications would be included in respiratory, but it doesn't include anything specifically about like side effects and stuff. So definitely make sure to like get that, like to get the side effects and things if you don't have it already. Um, but anyway, so um, from Dr. Remy, I know she was saying that for the pathophysiology, we're talking about um, an upper airway obstruction, and that's from inflammation. So inflammation is the cause for asthma, right? They're having some sort of inflammation, which is causing a hyper responsiveness, and it's causing bronchospasms, which is basically narrowing of the airway. And the reason why um, they say, you know, asthma is usually caused by something like um, allergy is the strongest pre uh, disposing factor. And that's because inflammation is usually triggered by mast cells and mast cells are histamine, which means they're inflammatory markers. And they also produce IgE and IgE is released in response to an allergen. So that's why people who have like asthma, they usually say, okay, like if you have allergies, that could be a huge trigger. Um, and that's why, like, I think in one of the questions she may put, cause I saw something related on course point, like what, um, what causes like asthma and it mentioned IgE. So if you know IgE, you also know that means allergies and that also relates to inflammation. So we have all of that going on. So basically asthma, we're thinking about some sort of upper airway obstruction and the obstruction is due to inflammation or swelling of um, the upper airways, right? And all that inflammation is going to lead to, I always think, okay, if this is respiratory. I'm thinking about respiratory complications. And the most predominant one is wheezing. And that's because wheezing is from some sort of narrowing of large airways, right? So if asthma, right, is inflammation that leads to things like bronchospasms and bronchospasms are narrowing of airways and asthma relates to an upper respiratory problem, there is upper respiratory obstruction or narrowing of the airway. So we get wheezing. That's why wheezing is one of the most common things you see in asthma. And that would pretty much, I think, when you think about how do I know which respiratory disorder is what, because that's what I was kind of thinking about yesterday going through my notes. Wheezing is one of the things that I'm going to say. I know I'm talking about asthma when I see this in my patient scenario. And yeah, there's going to be dyspnea, there's going to be chest tightness, there could be poor gas exchange, right? They could have a lot of CO2 retention, especially if they're hyperventilating, such as through like an asthma attack, right? But um, that key characteristic is wheezing. For medical management, Dr. Remy was saying we could look at ABGs, right? Because they're hyperventilating. And we know that when someone is hyperventilating, they can be in respiratory alkalosis. Um, we want to look at um, pulmonary function tests. We want to look at peak flow, um, which I'll get into a little later. And um, FEV1, which is an expiratory volume rate. We want to look at all that, which is going to tell us the airflow um, through these spastic airways because we said these are bronchospasms. We also want to look at sputum cultures because, yeah, it could be allergens, but it could be respiratory. Like this is from our um, textbook, but it could be related to respiratory infections. Um, it could be related to something that they've ingested or some sort of medications. It could be to exercise or hyperventilation. There could be different causes. So we want to like get a good analysis of what's going on. But we also have to know that allergies is one of the biggest things that can cause it. Um, we also have different medications that we can give, right? So we said that this is inflammation, right? Closing of the airways, and that could also lead to, right, some sort of 
mucus buildup and things like that. So um, we can give mucolytics, right? Um, and Dr. Remy was mentioning you can give things like Monte Lucas or Mucamist. Um, bronchodilators. Now, the really important thing with bronchodilators is that in a, a bronchodilator like albuterol is a short acting beta agonist, which basically means that you give those during asthma attacks. You will not give salmeterol for an asthma attack, even though it's beta adrenergic agonist, meaning it acts on those um, beta receptors or mimics them. Salmeterol is long acting, so it's going to take a longer time for that um, bronchodilator to do what it needs to do. They might take a few hours to actually you know, have some sort of um, effect. That's why salmeterol um, is a long acting and it's used for long-term maintenance, whereas albuterol is short acting. It's going to work within a few minutes and it's going to help relieve an asthma attack. That's why, you know, if they have an asthma attack, if they ask what medication to give, you'll give a short acting or albuterol. Um, and side effects include things like tachycardia, tremors, headaches, nausea and vomiting, and even looking flushed. So we have to think, okay, if we know that tachycardia, right, is one of the symptoms, and even if you're like, why is it tachycardia? Remember, these work on beta receptors. They specifically work on beta 2, but because they're still mimicking beta receptors, they could always trigger beta 1s, and beta 1s act and cause, um, they act on the heart muscle and the heart to cause um, an increase in contractility and heart rate. So that's why we have to check um, vitals for heart rate and even their SpO2 because remember, we want to make sure that we're giving the medication for the right reasons. Um, we could also use humidifiers and we could tell them to increase fluid intake because both of those will help loosen any secretions because we said asthma doesn't just have to be based on allergies. It could be also respiratory infections. So if it's a respiratory infection, that means they could be having a lot of mucus buildup, which means we need to loosen that up to help alleviate any sort of um, airway obstructions. Um, other Causes could be smoke or dust or pollen, anything like that. So I'm not going to get too much into everything that I have in my notes because we have kind of been talking about it. But just as a repeat, right, asthma is inflammation. It's chronic inflammation that leads to this hyper responsive, right? And it's going to cause maybe a lot of mucus, right? That inflammation is going to cause chest tightness and wheezing, right? Because wheezing means upper airway obstruction and what is asthma causing? It's causing bronchospasms or narrowing of the airways, and these are the upper airways that asthma is affecting. And in class, for these type of patients, um, the, a nursing diagnosis that's prominent is ineffective airway clearance, okay? Um, so we already talked about the manifestations. And remember, every time we have a patient, right, and we need to figure out what we do first, right, even though we might want to say give them albuterol, which we will do probably if they're having an asthma attack, but we always need to assess first, right? We need to always assess um, before we do anything, before we give. And that's always a rule of thumb. If you, even if you don't know what to do, it's always best to just pick the answer that says assess because 99% of the time, from what I've seen, it's always the answer that has to do with assess because that's what we need to do first. We need to follow add pi or assess. So once we get our assessment done, then we can say, okay, is it appropriate to give them the bronchodilator? Is it, you know, um, an asthma attack, right? Or is it from something like, you know, mucus buildup? So then maybe we could do something to alleviate that, maybe like chest PT or something. So we always want to assess first. Um, we talked about medications. I just want to mention that when it comes to steroids, if we're going to give corticosteroids, they're long acting medications, right? They're not used in adjunct um, for quick relief, but you have to give um, a bronchodilator like albuterol or salmeterol first before you give a cortical steroid. And that's because one, we want to open the airways with the bronchodilator. Two is that cortical steroids don't 
take the effect this as quickly as a bronchodilator and they also help enhance the effects of beta 2. So when you give the bronchodilator first and then the corticosteroid you're actually enhancing the effects of the bronchodilator which helps the airway and the patient so much more than if you did it the other way. Um and also things that uh Dr. Remy also mentioned is that right we have to taper down because they could have bleeding when they're on corticosteroids. So we need to watch like those PT, PTT times. Um, and we want to make sure that, especially um, when we're talking about, you know, corticosteroids, they need to rinse their mouth. And that's why if you see like a metered dose inhaler, I remember she was mentioning something like that, like you rinse your mouth with bronchodilators. And that's because a lot of times when they're prescribed like a bronchodilator or an inhaler, I should say is a better word, um, they usually have like, it's usually a combination of like albuterol and say bethamethasone or prednisone. They usually come together. That's why it's a rule of thumb to say, okay, like inhale and then rinse because most of the time you get the inhaler with um, a steroid in it. Um, and yeah, so like I said, we're tapering down for corticosteroids and we also want to rinse the mouth um, and also watch out for urinary retention. Um for patient teaching, right, we talked about it has to do with allergies and things. So we want to make sure that they avoid any triggers. If it's from smoking, if it's of a specific allergy, we said it could be exercise, it could be weather changes, teach them that, right? Teach them also um, how to use the um, inhalers properly, and that they need to rinse their mouth, right? And just and um, another thing that I want to mention is the peak flow. So basically, I, I don't know exactly what the thing looks like. But what I understand from the peak flow is that they essentially get this little thing that they put in their mouth. And they have to exhale and blow really, really hard into it. And they're going to get a certain number or percentage um, after they perform this. So if they have between 80 and 100, that's really good. Um, that means that they're able to exhale or they're able to, you know, push a lot of air out. And that's really good. That shows that their lungs are working well. Yellow would be mm, the asthma is not being taken care of. And that's usually when the peak flow is 50 to 80 percent. And red is like dangerous if they're not having um, if they're not having greater than 50 percent. That means that they really need to take, um, they really need to seek medical attention, especially if those bronchodilators aren't working. And remember, we would be giving them, we would tell them, hey, if you're in that yellow zone, right, or in that red zone, you need to take your short acting bronchodilator, your albuterol. And if that doesn't work, especially in the red zone, they have to go seek medical attention because that means they're not being able to breathe properly and they're not exhaling properly. They're not getting rid of um co2 properly so that's why they perform peak flow monitoring and all, like i said it all depends on how bad the asthma is because we know it's a reversible a thing as dr remy said they could grow out of it um but i just wanted to mention that with the peak flow so she could ask in a question how do we know the asthma is worsening if it said peak flow is green or peak flow is 80 to 100, I know that's good. If it said the peak flow was 50 to 80%, I could say, okay, there's an issue here, right? If it said peak flow 50%, I would pick that for a select will apply because that's telling me the asthma is getting worse or the treatments are not helping. Okay. The next question is to identify the pathophysiology of chronic pulmonary disease. Um, so... Basically, um, we're talking about COPD, right? We're talking about a really slow progressing respiratory disease from airflow obstruction. So this means like it starts with the upper airway. So they could have something like asthma and it gets progressively worse and getting into those lower airways and could affect the alveoli, which could affect the gas exchange. That's why nursing diagnosis for COPD is usually impaired gas exchange. Um, that alpha antitrypsin, which is, I believe it's an enzyme, um, that is deficit 
when they have COPD, which is a specific type of respiratory. Um, I think I wrote it somewhere. I, I probably will find it somewhere, but it's a specific type of respiratory enzyme that prevents damage to the respiratory system. So when alpha antitrypsin is damaged, it hurts the lungs. And Chronic pulmonary disease is a combination of respiratory diseases. It's not just, oh, I have COPD. COPD is caused from things like bronchiectasis, asthma, cystic fibrosis, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. So there's just a bunch of different things going on with this patient, and that's why it's chronic. Um, and we said it's obstructive, right? And because they have all these problems, they're having impaired gas exchange, which is leading to they can't really expel CO2. That's why these type of patients are usually in respiratory acidosis um, because they are retaining too much CO2. And other things, like I said, we're talking about and that antitrypsin hormone, I mean, hormone enzyme, sorry, is deficit. So the lungs are being damaged, alveoli being damaged. So there's more surface tension, less surfacants. I think that's how you say it. Or, um, so that means that the alveoli can't do what it needs to do, which is gas exchange. So there's just a lot of problems when we're talking about COPD and it's accumulation of respiratory disorders. And something that I notice that keeps coming up when it comes to COPD is that tobacco smoke is one of the most common causes. So one of the things that we want to keep telling them is to stop smoking. Um, other things could be increased age, right? If they work in an occupation where they're exposed to harsh chemicals and dust, air pollution. And I actually, I think I found this from the textbook where it said alpha-1 antitrypsin is an enzyme inhibitor that normally counteracts the destruction of lung tissue by other certain enzymes. So when that enzyme is damaged, the alpha-1 antitrypsin, the lungs are damaged. And that's what's happening in our COPD patients. Okay. The next question is, what are the therapeutic effects of a bronchodilator um, for a client with COPD? Now, someone who has COPD is more than likely going to be on those like longer acting medications because this is a chronic disease. So we're going to be thinking about things like salmeterol, right? But regardless, it could be on any type, right? But they're still bronchodilators and they're going to be given one to help open the airways. Um, and a therapeutic effect is, well, this is a bronchodilator or bronco, right? We're talking about lungs. So it's dilating the lungs. This is actually going to help, at least Dr. Remy emphasized, this is increases expiratory flow rate. Does anybody else have anything else they want to add for this type of question? Um, or anything else they want to add about anything I said? Okay. Hey. But yeah, it's a bronchodilator, right? So it's supposed to help dilate the lungs. So we want to think this is going to help them breathe better. And it's also going to increase the expiratory rate, right? Because these patients usually have a decrease um, expiratory rate because they're retaining too much CO2, right? So if they're retaining CO2, they can't expel it properly. So we want to increase that expiratory rate. We want to help get rid of that CO2. That's another reason why, right, with the oxygen, especially for those COPD patients, we're only giving them like one to two liters via nasal cannula or like 30 to 50% on a Venturi mask because they are so hypoxic that they have so much retention of CO2 that even though oxygen is good, it's bad for them. Too much of it is bad because it's they're not used to it. Their body is used to being in this state where they have so much CO2. So that's why we have to give them little oxygen, little by little, uh, to help these types of patients. Um, okay. The next question is to provide patient teaching for a client with asthma and list the signs and symptoms. We pretty much talked about the signs and symptoms, so I'm not going to get too much into that. But Dr. Remy emphasized for this question to adhere to the medication regime, right? They need to adhere to taking their um, bronchodilators, especially um, before exercise. I know sometimes when um, I've seen a few questions where they say like, a patient who's planning to exercise, they should take their bronchodilator, especially if it's a long acting one to two hours before, or if it's like a shorter acting within like 30 minutes before exercise to help them breathe better before they start. 
Um, we also want to teach them about their symptoms, right? Such as that they're going to have, we talked about wheezing, chest tightness, cough, dyspnea, right? But if it feels like it's worsening, we need to tell them what to do in those situations, right? And um, like when they're having an asthma attack. And we also want to remind them, right, to avoid triggers and to avoid allergies, right? Because those things can make the asthma worse. And we don't want them to be around anything that's just going to make their asthma act up. So like I said, I'm not going to get into everything again, but the main teaching point, right, is to know what to do when they have an exacerbation or an asthma attack, right? They should take their medications. They should avoid any triggers. And and also they should know what their symptoms look like and what it will look like if they have worsening symptoms. The next question is to provide nursing management of a client with bronchiectasis and include patient teaching. Now I noticed for this particular question, she started talking about uh, chronic bronchitis. So I kind of included both in my notes, but just to understand that bronchiectasis, which I said chronic, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, these are all things that can cause COPD. We spoke about that before, but um, bronchiectasis is specifically a chronic irreversible dilation of the bronchi and bronchiolus. Um, and a key manifestation that you see in this and chronic bronchitis is, remember, they're both happening in the same area, right? We're talking about something's going on in the bronchi and the bronchiolus with both bronchiectasis and chronic bronchitis. Both of them are characterized with lots of sputum buildup or mucus buildup and a cough. So just keep that in mind, right? So we're thinking about sputum and cough production um, in these patients. So we want to make sure we treat that. For chronic bronchitis, right, specifically for this, it's when they have cough and sputum production for at least three months in each of two consecutive years. Um, but the key takeaway is that they're having a sputum production, a lot of it, and a cough. So we want to treat that. And she also said wherever there is sputum or like mucus and there's water, there's also infections. So we need to make sure that they're on antibiotics, right? They have mucus and a cough. So we want them to do, you know, breathing exercises and chest PT and and encourage them um, to do deep breathing and coughing exercises. Um, smoke, like any other respiratory problem, is always an issue, right? Smoke, tobacco use, uh, pollutants, all of that can be causing the inflammation and the dilation of the airways that we see in chronic bronchitis and uh, bronchiectasis because these are problems with those two specific areas. So smoke and stuff, no occupational exposure. No. And you could think of that, right? Hmm, what, what am I seeing as a common symptom in all of these respiratory disorders, right? Smoking, occupational exposure, pollutants are not good and they're hard on the lungs, right? But what are differences? Well, we know with COPD, it's an accumulation of different respiratory disorders. We know with asthma, we're talking about inflammation, but of upper airways. So we see wheezing. We're talking about chronic bronchitis and bronchiectasis, and their main symptom has to do with sputum production and cough, as well as they can cause um, chronic bronchitis and bronchiectasis, uh, core pulmonality, which is basically right-sided heart failure um, that is caused from this these issues. So these are just things that I want you to just think about. The reason I brought them up both together like that is because they're both similar and they're related to each other. Um, that's why I mentioned it this way. And their key takeaway is that for both, like I said, bronchitis and bronchiectasis is that they're having sputum production and a cough. But in order to diagnose chronic um, bronchitis, they need to have a cough and sputum production for at least three months in each of two consecutive years. And you see when we're talking about management and medical management for bronchiectasis, because there wasn't any of this in the slides for uh, chronic bronchitis, right? They have a chronic cough. They have sputum production and copious amounts, right? And the management has to do with post drainage, chest PT, smoking cessation, right? We said antimicrobial therapy because anytime there's fluid and mucus, you have potentially infections, as well as bronchodilators and mucolytics. Rule of thumb, 
all of these can go for every respiratory disorder. So you can always think, okay, when I'm thinking of a selective lead apply, pick things that help with um, respiratory complaints, as well as um, what could help with infections and what medications I give when I see respiratory complications. And you usually go to things like bronchodilators and mucolytics. But remember, for chronic bronchitis and bronchiectasis, it's a lot of sputum production and a cough, a, a cough that we see with these patients. Okay, the next question is to assess a client with acute airway obstruction and provide the most accurate diagnostic test. And I saw this question like like exactly like this on course point and. As Dr. Remy said, the answer would have to be pulmonary function tests because those indicate um, if there's airway obstruction. If the pulmonary function test is not greater than 70, that indicates airway obstruction. Okay. Number seven is to identify complications of a client with lower respiratory disorders, such as diminished breathing and physical assessment findings. Like I said, a rule of thumb, when I'm seeing a selective lead apply with respiratory and it's talking about respiratory complications, I already know I'm picking negatives that have to do with respiratory, right? So if we're thinking about lower respiratory, we're thinking about a lot of problems with gas exchange, right? So we expect to see a lower SpO2, a harder time breathing, maybe crackles, right? That's going to cause diminished breathing sounds. Um, smoking, they shouldn't be smoking. Um, they could have dyspnea, tachypnea. They could even have hypoventilation depending on what type of respiratory disorder it is. Like, for example, in COPD, they're, um, they could be prone to respiratory acidosis. Um, and for interventions and such, we want to help them breathe better. So if I'm thinking, okay, this is a respiratory problem, I need respiratory interventions. That could include things like oxygen, making sure they sit upright, right, in a tripod position and things like that. Um, and we could do things, you know, like chest PT, post drainage, all that stuff. Okay. Anything anybody wants to add? Okay, so this question already repeats, so I'm not going to get too much again into the COPD, but she did mention um, COPD exacerbations, and she said that our role is to identify the cause, because remember, see, we talked about how COPD is accumulation of different respiratory disorders, and we need to treat whatever that cause is, right? If it's like an asthma problem related in COPD, we might have a different intervention than someone who has bronchiectasis or emphysema. So we just need to see what's going on with this patient. And I've seen a lot on course point where it says that they're having a COPD exacerbation. Our first thing is we want to give them oxygen. Um... Okay, we already talked about, right, like the different complications, right? We already said chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, asthma, emphysema. And um, Dr. Remy mentioned that this is um, where we have abnormal distension of air spaces, which basically just leads to the destruction of the walls of the alveoli. So if there's something wrong with the alveoli, we mean there's something wrong with gas exchange, right? And this is still a respiratory disorder. So we know we could have cough and sputum production and dyspnea and things like that. You do see symptoms repeat a lot. So always just think about that. If I see a respiratory uh, problem and I'm thinking about what respiratory signs and symptoms in terms of like negatives, right? I know dyspnea, they'll have cough, they'll have sputum, all the respiratory things. Um, she also mentioned that for nursing diagnoses for COPD, right, impaired gas exchange, because one of the causes can be, right, emphysema, and we saw that destruction of the alveoli, right? They could have an ineffective breathing pattern, such as if they have respiratory acidosis, they're hypoventilating. They could have a knowledge deficit, right, such as not knowing that they need to stop smoking or how to take their medications. They're going to have fatigue or activity intolerance because of the fact that they're having a hard time breathing, right? They don't have as much oxygen in their body, which means they're going to be more fatigued when they try to do day-to-day -day activities. They could also have an altered nutrition, less than body requirements, because if they're having dyspnea and they're having a hard time doing day-to-day -day activities, it could just feel harder to eat and harder to do things. Um, 
She also mentioned for nursing management, right, we want to give antimicrobials, um, make sure they're up to date with their vaccinations, um, oxygen as ordered. And we said oxygen, we are especially giving if the question says they have COPD exacerbations, meaning exacerbation means it's getting worse. Um, chest PT, especially for COPD patients, the breathing technique of choice is that purse slip. And she's, I saw a course point question exactly like this. And it said, why do we do purse slips? And it's for two reasons to help expand the lungs, but it also prevents alveolar collapse. So I did see this answer choice, the preventing alveoli collapse in a course point question that I saw. Right, we could also do incentive spirometer, bronchodilators, all of that stuff. And obviously we want to encourage smoking cessation because one we said that one of the most common causes of COPD is tobacco smoke. So even if you can't remember all of this stuff, that's okay. But think, okay, if it's a respiratory problem, I need to think, okay, what are my respiratory interventions, right? What are things that I should be thinking about? If I'm thinking about respiratory, we always need to watch out for infection because there's going to be potential fluid and mucus buildup and then the list goes on. But for COPD, the breathing technique of choice is usually per slip. And I'll get into something that I'll share with you right now. Um... And another primary symptom of COPD, even though we already said we we're talking about, right, like cough, sputum production, right, they have dyspnea, they have all the things that all the other respiratory disorders have. But one of the common things that you'll typically see in someone with COPD is barrel chest. That will be normal for someone who has COPD. You wouldn't see that and find it as an abnormal effect of COPD. I just want you to think about it like that because you might say, oh, barrel chest, that's bad. If they ask, what do you expect to see? We expect to see barrel chest. That wouldn't be a negative complication because that's an expected um, side effect because of the fluid and mucus buildup. It's not something that we don't expect to see. I just wanted to point that out there. So remember, all respiratory signs and symptoms, but they will also have a barrel chest. Um, other complications that weren't in the list that uh, Dr. Remy mentioned is that I wanted to mention atelectasis, right? If they don't have a good cough reflex, they're not coughing and deep breathing. They're not able to get rid of that mucus production. They can go into atelectasis. They could also go into pneumonia thorax, which is when they have air that enters the pleural space. Um, and that could be you know, a result of any of the complications that they're having. So just think about that when you have COPD is that that's one of the reasons why we emphasize, right, especially coughing and breathing techniques to prevent some of these other complications. And we may even give, um, you know, antimicrobials to prevent respiratory infections or even things like um, pneumonia. Um, okay, so we already said smoking cessation, da, da, da. Um, Patient education, like this is just directly from the slides, but like I said, we said smoking cessation, make sure they take their medications, make sure they do breathing exercises, they have regular exercise, they have realistic goals, and they have emergency management care. They know what to do if they have um, an emergency, right? Like if they feel like they're having trouble breathing, they should seek help immediately. Um, I wanted to show this because we were talking about purse lip breathing. I found this in a chart in one of the slides, and I just wanted to mention that where it said goal, that the goal of purse lip breathing is to prolong ex exhalation and increase airway pressure during expiration, thus reducing the amount of trapped air and the amount of airway resistance. I just wanted to point that out. Um, I thought that'd be kind of important to know what the goal is, right? So remember we said that people who have COPD, asthma, all these problems, they cannot expel CO2. So they're not able to exhale properly. So the goal of per slip breathing is to help them exhale that CO2. Um, yeah, okay. So anything anybody wants to add? Okay, so the next question is to assess and provide on nursing interventions for a client with COBD and explain the rationale. What I have that Dr. Remy mentioned for this question is to instruct for deep breathing using purse lip. 
And the reason that they do this is to prevent alveoli collapse and it helps expand the lungs. The next question is to provide nursing interventions um, for a client with symptoms of COPD exacerbation. Like I said, I did see um, on course point, if they have exacerbation, we want to give O2. And um, one of the goals is that we want to get them back to their maximal level of functioning as an overall goal when someone who has COPD um, because they can have these exacerbations, but the priority nursing intervention that I keep seeing coming up at course point is to give them O2. I don't know why this is not here, but it should be give O2 if they have an exacerbation. Okay, the next chapter is to um, have management of patient with arrhythmias and conduction disorders. And the first question is to define the rationale and educate a client about a transvenous pacemaker. Um, okay, so um, the first thing I want to mention for this, the rationale is that Dr. Emmy was saying that we use it because there's an atrial problem on the right side. So that means that there is a systolic issue. There's a problem with um, the heart's ability to increase its own heart rate. So we give a pacemaker in situations, this is Dr. Remy's words, right, when they're bradycardic, because it's going to help the heart rate. That's what we want to do. We want to raise the heart rate. That's why we give a pacemaker for someone who is bradycardic. So we could help pace the heart to send um, signals to that SA node to do what it needs to do and get that heart rate back to a normal amount. Now for education, I'm going to point out, you can go to textbook page seven, 719. It talks about all the things that um, a pacemaker um needs or what should or should not be allowed. So um, when we're talking about, um, like I said, pacemakers, I just want to point out a few things. Um, one is that household electronics are safe, such as microwaves. They are safe. They don't need to avoid microwaves. Anything that includes magnets, like an earpiece of a phone, large stereo speakers, anything like that, that should not be included um, or near this patient, okay? They should not be there for long periods of time. Um, any cell phone should not be in the pocket or the same pocket of the side of the pacemaker. They should be somewhere else in a back pocket. They should not be um, near where the pacemaker is or according to the textbook, it should be six to 12 inches away. Large magnetic fields like MRIs, things like that, they should not be near any of them. They have to let an MRI technician know they cannot go near those spaces. Um, if they feel dizzy, right, Dr. Remy said, if you feel dizzy and lightheaded, that's a sign that the thing, the pacemaker is failing. They need to get emergency care immediately. Another thing that I keep seeing come up, especially with course point, is that they cannot have a handheld uh, search with a device, right? If they're going to an airport, they need to have a hand device. It sounds weird, but they need to have somebody to hand search them when they go to an airport. They cannot use one of those little devices because that could trigger the pacemaker and cause it to have problems. So when they go to an airport, they should carry an identification card that lets them know, hey, I have a pacemaker, so they can't use that little handheld search device. They need to hand search me. They need to touch the person with their hands, not with a device, because those magnetic um, signals can interfere with the pacemaker and cause it not to work. Um, and they could also, the pacemaker can call like anti-theft uh, machines or like those, like, you know, when you walk into a mall and they have like those things to let you know if you walked out with something, like those can go off when you have a pacemaker. So you just need to let like either the security know or just walk past them really quickly because so they don't go off or anything like that. Okay. And like I said, you can go to page 719 in the textbook to get all of this that I'm talking about. It's like in a chart, but I copied it into the notes. Um, okay. 
The next thing is to interpret an EKG strip seen with uh, serum potassium when it's low and refer to EKG strip. So I had this from Sam, thank shout out to her. She had this picture, which related exactly to what Dr. Remy said. And it, Dr. Remy said that when you have hypokalemia, you'll have a depressed um, T wave, you'll have a peaked P wave, right? So the P wave is gonna be peaked. The T wave is gonna be depressed and you'll have a prominent U wave, or as she called it, like an extra T. So those are things that we are looking for when they have um, hypokalemia. Does anybody have anything to add? Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to point out is question number three, which is knowing the EKG strips. Like I said, I'm not going to go into all of them, like A flutter, A fib, sinus, sinus Brady, all of that. You could go into like the the PDF thing that she sent. But what I wanted to emphasize is that, as Dr. Mary mentioned, the PR interval should be three to five boxes or 0 0.5. 12 to 0 0.20. And that's because every small box, every little box is 0 0.04. So if the PR interval is between three to five, which is going to be equivalent to 0 0.04 times three or 0 0.04 times five, giving you 0 0.12 to 0 0.20. Another thing is that that QRS complex is going to tell us the heart rate. That's something that Dr. Um, Remy mentioned. Um, and always, if we're thinking about an arrhythmia, right, we need to be looking at heart rate, right? We need to know their vitals and we need to get an EKG because we need to know what sort of arrhythmia. And I did see a course point question that had like a strip and it had ventricular tachycardia and basically asked, what is it? It could, I think it's going to be a question like that. So I would say just go over the strips, know what they look like and know how to identify them for each. Um, and yeah, um, I'm not going to like say get into everything when we're talking about arrhythmias, but just know, right. This patient's going to feel like palpitations, right. Um, especially if it's like something like AFib, um, a flutter, um, or like VTAC, um, those are going to make you feel really jittery, right? So they could be anxious. You want to calm them down, right? Because that's going to add on to the heart rate. If they're feeling dizzy or lightheaded, you know, that could be a sign of arrhythmia. That could be a sign of sinus bradycardia because they could get dizzy and lightheaded. So that's why we want to make sure that they're on a 12 lead EKG, right? They also need to know when they're home, how to take care of themselves, how to look at, um, how to take their pulse before they give medications, right? And they need to know what to do in case of emergencies, right? If they if they feel like they're having another, you know, arrhythmia or the medication aren't working, they need to seek help. Um, and the goal for someone who has an arrhythmia is to eradicate it or decrease the occurrence of an arrhythmia to maintain cardiac output. I also will mention when we get into the question with... Um, the implantable cardio, um, I think cardioverter defibrillator or the ICD. So I'll mention something over there as, as just someone remind me if I don't. Um, but the next thing is to assess and provide nursing management of a client with AFib and include medications. So I know I don't have um, a picture here, but I'll actually just scroll down to the bottom of my notes so you can see. Um, just so you could see a strip of what AFib looks like. AFib, you can think of the waves at that there's really no pattern and you do not see any P waves. You cannot tell me reading this that you know which one of these weird fibrillatory waves is a P wave. That also means there's no PR interval. If I don't see a P wave, there is no PR interval. We don't know what it is or how to discern it. That's what AFib means. There's no P wave, they're fibrillatory and the heart rate is really, really high. And one of the goals um, with someone who has AFib is we want to control that heart rate. And we also want to watch out for clotting. 
because a risk is an ischemic stroke and also clotting. So our goals for someone who has AFib is to control their heart rate and to give anticoagulants, right? Like heparin or warfarin. And we control the heart rate with things like calcium channel blockers, such as like nifedipine or cardizem, right? So that's why it becomes so important to know what AFib, that's how I'm going to manage my patient. If I see AFib, if I see AFib on my EKG, right? Because I've assessed them. I've gotten that 12 lead EKG. I know my goals are to control that heart rate and to give them anticoagulants to prevent any problem. And I know when I see AFib, I'm looking for, right? I don't see a P wave. I don't see um, any PR interval, right? And that heart rate is going to be really sky high. They can also have manifestations like dizziness, anxiety, tachycardia, tachypnea, shortness of breath. They could have all of those things, right? Especially if there's like a clot that's inducing it. Um, she also mentioned that someone who has diabetes are at risk for AFib. So I just wanted to mention that. Whereas a flutter almost just looks like little, I don't know, I call them little hills. Like they almost look like consistent little hills. So just don't get a flutter and a fib confused. They usually say a flutter is sawtooth and a fib is fibrillatory waves, but they both have the same characteristics in terms of there's no P wave and there's no PR interval. And both the QRS complexes are normal. And what that means by normal is you're able to see them, right? They don't look abnormal or out of whack and they're within the their normal parameters um i just wanted to show an example because it could be a little confusing when you're talking about these things but yeah i just want to say that's our management right um and assessment things that dr remy pointed out is like i said a 12 lead ekg we need to know what we're working with um we need to get their vitals because they could have a high heart rate and a high blood pressure they're at risk for um, stroke and clot. So we need to make sure that we assess for that as well. We could do ABGs and blood tests. And we even want to monitor blood sugar because we said diabetics can have arrhythmias and they can go specifically into AFib. Other medications she also mentioned was like clopidogrel, aspirin, coumadin, right? Statins, because remember statins could block um. Like if you have a high cholesterol, you could have, you know, blocked arteries, blocked uh, areas. It could lead to clotting and it could also lead to AFib and things like that. Um, we have different medications like to control the heart rate, um, like calcium channel blockers. We can give the joxin to help with the heart's contractility, you know, things like that. And even amiodarone for um, like an antiarrhythmia drug because amiodarone will help with controlling the heart rate. And we know that she said specifically for digoxin, right? Digoxin is one of those that helps make the heart stronger and helps with contractility. That digoxin could even cause arrhythmia. So we don't want to give digoxin if the heart rate is not normal. And we do that by assessing the apical pulse, which is that um, the left fifth um, intercostal space mid-sternal line or mid-sternal border. That's where it's located. Um... But yeah, I mean, you could also go to page um, 699 to see the different risk factors for AFib. So I'm not going like, to get into all of them. But one of the ones that she specifically mentioned was diabetes. And remember that they could have um, clots. So we have to watch out for that too. And we already talked about the characteristics of AFib, like what it looks like, right? There's no P wave. There's no PR interval, things like that. Um. Okay. The next question is to provide education to a client with an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So basically, um, you can go to page two seven I mean, seven two three <laughs> to find um, all the different restrictions. I'm not going to get too much into it because it's it's the exact same as the transvenous pacemaker. But just know, microwaves are safe. You can go near a microwave. And another thing specifically, since this isn't a permanent pacemaker, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator is permanent. So they need to also um, check their pulses daily because they need to report if there's any sort of rapid change in their pulse rate. Um, they also need to 
write down what we call logs, which is every time they feel a shock or they feel that, you know, their um, defibrillator sent an impulse, they need to log that down because if they're having too many shocks, that could mean that they're, they need to change the settings on the ICD. And the same concept, right? If there's dizziness, that means the pacemaker is failing. And another thing that I also see with ICD is that when they first get it implanted, right, they cannot move their arm on the same side over their head for like two weeks and they can't perform any sort of activities for two weeks. And they can never, ever do contact sports because of it. Um, but yeah, all of the other, like I said, the same things that we talked about before with the pacemaker apply, but that you can go to that page that I mentioned before to actually see more. Um, for question number six, which is assess a client with AFib and shortness of breath and provide nursing interventions, I didn't see anything in the textbook that had that said nursing interventions other than the idea is to control the heart rate and give them anticoagulants. And I've even seen like course point questions that say like, oh, you know, like someone who has AFib, you want to make sure that the priority is to give them anticoagulant therapy. But this question says if they have AFib and shortness of breath, I'm assuming... Um, we would want to give them like oxygen and then also manage the arrhythmia by, you know, like we said, controlling the heart rate and things like that. But is there anything else anybody would want to add to this question? Okay, so yeah, that's just what I'm thinking. I think I'd have to see the question to know, but think about all the medications that we can give, right? Like antiarrhythmia drugs, things like that, right? If they're having shortness of breath related to the AFib, we might want to give them oxygen, check their SpO2, but we really got to control the heart rate and correct that AFib because the shortness of breath is only going to get worse um, if they're continuing, they're staying in this arrhythmia. Okay. Chapter 23, Management of Patients with Coronary Vascular Disorders. The first one is assess and provide nursing interventions and treatments of a client with acute coronary syndrome. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that acute coronary syndrome is an emergent situation that is characterized by an onset of myocardial ischemia or a lack of blood flow to the myocardium or the muscle of the heart. And if it gets that bad, there's too much lack of perfusion to the heart, it can lead to something called myocardial death or death of a part of the heart, which is what an MI is. So an MI is when there is death or myocardial infarction is when there is death to a part of the heart. So if we want to talk about assessing and providing treatments for a client with acute coronary syndrome, she said, focus on the goal. The goal is this right here, which is to decrease or balance myocardial oxygen demand and increase oxygen supply. I believe I saw a question like this on course point, but remember they have an increased myocardial demand, um, oxygen demand, which means that they need more oxygen because they don't have it. Our goal is to decrease the myocardial oxygen demand and increase the oxygen supply so the heart doesn't need to strain itself to get it. Um, people who have acute coronary syndrome will also have chest pain. Now, if they're going to have an MI, it's not going to be stable angina, or so we say chest pain. It'll be unstable, and that's where we're going to have to do the MONA or the morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin, right? That's what we would do for someone who has an MI. Someone who has stable angina is going to get nitroglycerin. Now, something that Dr. Remy mentioned specifically in class that I added in that was not specifically said um, when we met was that MI, um, they should be, if they have one from, let's just say um, they had an MI, they should be on bed rest for five to seven days after, and that they should also have elastic compression stockings to prevent D, uh, DVT. Um, after as well, because they're at risk for clotting. So we could give them things like the doctor might order TPAs to help uh, break clots if the cause was a clot, or um, just to make sure that if there is anything, right, we're getting rid of it because TPAs are used to break down clots. So we'll give them that as well as give them compression stockings to prevent any more formation of clots. Um, and 
we also want to make sure that if they are getting TPAs to help manage the MI, especially if it was due to like a clot um, in those coronary arteries that we're monitoring vitals and we're watching for bleeding like hematoma, which is also bruising, melena, which is like blood in the stool, hematuria or hemipotis. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but where you have like um, blood in your sputum. But like I said, just remember myocardial infarction um, is myocardial death to a part of the heart, right? So um, like I said, they'll have chest pain as a result of that death to the heart or that ischemia, right? So they could have dyspnea, they could have increased heart rate, respiratory rate. Um, they might not present with the normal symptoms of like chest pain radiating to their left arm and their jaw. Some people, especially older people, present with different symptoms like indigestion and nausea. That's why we need to look at EKG changes because an ST elevation is significantly um, helps us define that this is an MI, as well as lab studies, right? Like we look at creatinine kinase MB, which means um, that's for the heart muscle. If that is increased, they have an MI. If troponin is increased, they have an MI. That's the things that we want to look at um, because those are going to tell us if our patient is an MI. This, the symptoms alone cannot tell us if they are in. So if we see that they have chest pains and, and they're complaining of that, and we see that, hmm, this sounds like an MI, we want to get them on an EKG. We want to make sure that we draw labs because we need to assess them to figure out, is this what they really have, right? And remember, acute coronary syndrome can lead to MIs. So we want to make sure that we relieve the pain. And if they have ST elevation, that we take steps immediately to try to prevent, you know, any further damage to the heart, right? They could have all sorts of problems. If this is a heart, like if they have um, MI, they could have anything, right? They could have a pulmonary edema from heart failing, right? They can go into cardiogenic shock because of having an MI, arrhythmias, all of these problems, right? Um, so we need to make sure as well that because an MI means death or lack of blood flow, that we're having adequate tissue perfusion, okay? Um, those are just things like that. Like I said, we're looking, right? Oxygen will also help with the ischemia. That's why we do Mona, right? Morphine for the pain, you know, oxygen to help with the perfusion, right? And to get oxygen, um, nitroglycerin to help open up, you know, the arteries and the vessels and then aspirin that helps with, you know, preventing like clots. And it also helps with preventing the reoccurrence of an MI. That's why we do Mona. Okay. The next thing is to implement the major indication of a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty or PTCA. So Dr. Remy specifically said that this is done because there is an inclusion of an artery and we need to open up the artery and increase blood flow. That's what this procedure is. There's an occlusion. So this procedure opens up an artery and increases blood flow. And it could be due to arterial sclerosis, which is narrowing of the artery of the heart lumen, and atherosclerosis, which is fatty deposits in the arterial wall. And from my notes, I have that um, percutaneous PTCA is a balloon tipped catheter that is used to open blocked coronary vessels and resolve ischemia. Remember, ischemia means lack of blood flow. So our goal with this is to open blood flow when there is an occlusion. Okay. And we also, I've seen a few questions where they say, oh, they're getting a PTCA and um, it comes because it comes with contrast when they put it in. So make sure you're assessing for allergies. Like if they have hives and dyspnea, that could be a problem. They're having an allergic response and have epinephrine on standby when they get these sorts of procedures because it's related to allergies. Um, the next question is to assess and anticipate priority nursing action of a client with substernal chest pain. Anticipate the type of procedure to be performed. So for Dr. Remy's notes, I have substernal chest pain means that they're going into an MI and that we need to do things like I said, Mona, because MI means unstable chest pain. So we need to give Mona like morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin, right? EKG and cardiac monitor. Why? Because we're looking for that ST elevation. And then after we perform intervention, we want to make sure that they're still not having, you know, complications. We always want to look at vitals and we even want to call the cath lab so to see if they have any sort of arterial occlusion and can we, you know, help that. So they, them going to get a PTCA, right? So remember, we're talking about MI, we're talking about a problem with blood flow. 
We know that EKG changes are to happen. We know that there's going to be blood tests that we can look for. So we want to get blood tests. We want to put them on a monitor. We want to make sure we do mono. We want to make sure we get a cath lab. We send them there so that they can see if there's any occlusions and assess vitals. And just like as extra right chest pain or sometimes called in, um, angina pectoris is when they have um, insufficient coronary blood flow. So this is due to ischemia or lack of blood flow to the heart muscles is what is causing chest pain. MI is death of the heart tissue. I just want you to know that there's a difference. The lack of blood flow leads to the death, but they're different. If they ask what's the patho, right? But if we're talking about substernal chest pain, we're usually in relation to unstable angina where we see that ST elevation and we're doing MONA. But stable angina is pain that occurs on exertion and it's usually relieved by rest and nitroglycerin. Unstable angina, which we typically see in an MI, is not going to be relieved by rest or nitroglycerin, right? If, if they are taking their, you know, nitroglycerin sublingually five minutes apart by the second one, it's not doing its thing. It's not helping with the chest pain. They got to call 911. They got to go to the hospital because they could be having an MI, right? And we also want to tell them for someone who's taking nitroglycerin, right, that they're going to have a decreased blood pressure because it's a vaso and arterial dilator. It's a, it dilates. So we have to watch out for low blood pressure as well as a headache and they could be flushed. Those are our three things. And we want to store this in a dark room at 77 degrees Fahrenheit in its original container. She also said when they take it, tingling under the tongue is normal. I'm not going to really get into variant angina because it's not, not that important right now. Okay. The next question is define the pathophysiology of coronary artery disease. So like I said, I have, we talked about arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis, um, which atherosclerosis means fatty deposits in the arterial wall and arteriosclerosis means narrowing of the arter artery of the heart lumen. I want to mention that she specifically said no her triad, which means when you have either arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, and this coronary artery disease, we have something called a triad, which is changes in blood flow, um, changes in clot, and changes in the vessel wall. Those are what we're looking for. Those are our triad. Changes in blood clot, changes in vessel wall, changes in blood flow. So if we have, I just want to point out something that a few things that Course Point said is that when they have um, arteriosclerosis, it means that it is a loss of elasticity of the arteries that accompanies the aging process. Whereas atherosclerosis is a condition, a condition in which the arteries fill with plaque. Plaque is another way of saying fatty deposits. So atherosclerosis is, um, like I said, we're talking about fatty deposits and arteriosclerosis. You could think of the AR art for artery. It has something to do with the arteries, right? A loss of elasticity of the arteries. And atherosclerosis um, also is a type of atherosclerosis. Um, and... Yeah, those are just the most important things that I wanted to men mention, but regardless, both of them, whether it's arteriosclerosis, where there's a narrowing of the arterial wall lumen, or atherosclerosis, where there's fatty deposits in the, the artery lumen, whatever it is, it's still narrowing blood flow to the coronary arteries, which means if there's narrowing of blood flow, that means they're having going to have chest pain, they're going to have angina, right? Why they're having angina? Because angina means insufficient coronary blood flow. So they have arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, they're gonna have um, myocardial ischemia, which is going to lead to chest pain, right? That chest pain can radiate to the left arm, to the jaw. Um, they could have epigastric pain. They can have all of these things. It could even go into an MI because an MI is when they have myocardial death due to too much ischemia. So what are risk factors, right? Well, risk factors have to do with what can be causing it? If we're talking about atherosclerosis, right? Being overweight, being diabetic, having hyperlipidemia, right? Having too much cholesterol can put plaque buildup. Tobacco use can also have plaque buildup. Physical inactivity, being overweight, all of that can contribute to that, right? Um, as well as um, 
chronic inflammatory conditions, and even chronic kidney disease. But these are some of the main ones, right? So think about it. What are some, I would think of it as what are some disorders that can cause a problem to those arteries, right? What can block my arteries? So anything that has to do with weight related or things that I could control, right? Like if you eat too much cholesterol, you have, you smoke a lot, you have hypertension because of the way you eat, all of that can contribute to atherosclerosis and those problems. So depending on what's going on, right? We want to make sure that we control cholesterol. If they need cholesterol medications, that they have a good diet, that they're physically active, because we said being physically inactive can cause these clots, right? Smoking, we want to make sure they stop smoking, especially tobacco, because we want to increase that good cholesterol, but also prevent plaque buildup. Manage hypertension, because hypertension can also relate to atherosclerosis or the narrowing of the artery lumen, because hypertension puts pressure onto the arteries, making them stiffen over time, especially as we age, if you have that really high blood pressure, not good, and it makes the heart pump harder. And diabetes management, because it can cause um, dyslipidemia or problems with lipids, and it can even cause thrombus formation or clot formation, which we also said can lead to AFib and other problems. So we just see how all of these um, disorders are related. Um, so obviously actions to think about is, well, I got to watch out for my blood pressure on these patients because hypertension can be a cause. Want to make sure they have good pulses because they need to have good perfusion, right? If they have a good capillary refill, that's going to let me know if they're having good perfusion. And we want to look at those cholesterol, triglyceride levels, you know, EKGs, vitals, all of that. Now, I already, um, for question number five, it says identify the pathophysiology of an MI clinical symptoms. I kind of went into that, right? The importance of, you know, the, the labs like troponin, you know, CP, um, KMB, creatinine, kinase, MB, right? Making sure that we look at, um, you know, getting that EKG, um, if it's caused by like a clot, the MI, right? We want to make sure that we do a D dimer series where we look for clots um, and they could have a TPA ordered. If it is like streptokinase, your own kinase, ultiplase, things like that. Monitor vitals, right? Because this is um, a clot buster and monitor for bleeding because if it's breaking the clots down, there's a risk for bleeding. Also, a, a TPA can also be called a fibrinolytic, the same thing as saying a thrombolytic. Fibrinolytic, it's the same thing because fibrin is what makes clots. That's why it's called, a, it could be called a fibrinolytic. So I'm not going to get into all this again because I already said that. Um, the next question is develop a nursing diagnosis of a client of, with symptoms of unstable angina. Remember, angina means lack of coronary um, vessel perfusion which means the nursing diagnosis is going to be impaired tissue perfusion because something is causing um, lack of perfusion, right? And that's what angina is, it means insufficient coronary blood flow, which means, oh, impaired tissue perfusion. The last question is to identify the side effects of a tour of a statin. When we have statins, right, know that we're talking about hepatoxicity. Hepa means liver. It's the same thing as saying problems with the liver, but hepatoxicity, and they can have muscle pain. Does anybody have anything to add? No.